So um, I'm going to start out. Um, last month, I made a, like a whirlwind visit to seven cities in four different countries of the former Soviet Union in two weeks. <laughs> um, Russia, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, and Moldova. Um, and this trip was based around uh, an invitation that the International Action Center received to participate in an international anti-fascist conference in Lugansk on May 7th and 8th. The reason I crammed so much other stuff into this trip will hopefully become apparent. Um, first, I'm going to give an abbreviated slideshow on some of the highlights of the trip. And then I'm going to, uh, after that, I'm going to offer some observations on the struggle in Donbass republics and especially um, developments in the communist movement in the former Soviet Union. Um, so if someone could hit the lights in the front, that might make it easier to, to see. Thank you. Um, so um, for the, this is to sort of give you a sense, a little bit of a geographical sense of where I went. Um, Russia is over here. Um, Ukraine, uh, the former uh, parts of Ukraine in the Donbass region, Donetsk and Lugansk, and then Moldova is over here um, to the southwest of Ukraine. So I started out in Moscow um, in Russia, uh, then traveled by bus um, from the city of Rostov to Donetsk, the capital city of the Donetsk People Republic. Then um, to Lugansk, uh, several cities in Lugansk, and finally to Moldova before returning to New York. So um, this was from May Day in Moscow. Um, this was actually as people were gathering at the big statue of Lenin in the center of the city. Um, this is the like the big mass march of uh, organized by the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, which is, uh, you know, primarily led by reformist forces. Um, although it has more uh, youthful revolutionary forces that are developing in different places, um, and and this sort of has the character of a parade more than a protest. Uh, many thousands of people participate, not just the KPRF, also groups to the left of them, um, such as a brand new group called the New Communist Movement, who I met with and who, um, who I participated with on May Day. Um, it includes uh, a number of left activists uh, from different areas in Russia and, different, and, and f other former Soviet republics who are now living in Moscow and who are um, trying to take a sort of a more activist oriented approach. Um, and they're, they're also notable for um, taking on some issues that are really difficult uh, and, and, and uh, in the, to take up in that part of the world, such as the LGBT struggle, um, which is not generally acknowledged and, and um, struggled around by most of the communist groups. Um, this is Vanya. He's, a, he's also a member of Borotba, the Ukrainian communist organization that we've worked with the last couple of years. Um, and he's one of the leaders of this new formation and that he, that now that he's living in Moscow in exile. <clears throat> then uh, after that, I went to a second march, this one uh, that the party was invited to participate in uh, by a relatively new party called um, uh, the United Communist Party of Russia, uh, which was a left-wing split from the KPRF um, and also uh, incorporated other forces. This is something we would recognize more as our sort of style of May Day March, more militant chanting. Um, we marched through the district um, where in Moscow where, the, where that was the center of the 1905 revolution. And it included, you know, other groups and trade unions as well. These are comrades from Barotba, also from Ukraine, who are, are now living and working with the United Communist Party in Moscow. So then I went to Donetsk, and this is the magnificent statue of Lenin, <laughs> which I took too many, probably too many pictures of. 
but uh, it's really uh, it's the centerpiece of the city and it's really well respected and loved the first day I was in Donetsk we got to watch um, as the uh, the People's Army was uh, doing its rehearsal for Victory Day uh, in the center of the city. And it was really, it, it was such a, um, it really put the lie to the propaganda in the West about how, you know, there's a Russian occupation and it's like a terrorist regime in Donetsk. You know, people were lining the streets, people came out from their workplaces and from school and were just standing there and cheering on. Kids came out of, you know, after school were coming to watch and take selfies with the soldiers. Most of uh, uh, central Donetsk has been really uh, fixed up. Um, there's been a lot of repairs from the bombing two years ago by Ukraine. Um, but some, like this big hotel, which is completely closed, you know, still has barricades up on the doors and some of the windows are still crashed in. Um, but you know the pe the the government and the um, people's organizations in Donetsk are really working hard to s create a sense of normalcy in the city, even though the war is very close by, and people are returning. Now, just ten minutes outside of the center of the city, in that last picture, <laughs> this is what you see um, in uh, the district of Oktoberski which is near the airport. Um, people are still living there, not as many, of course, as before the war, but um, it's completely bombed out. Stores, theaters, um, a lot of this destruction is from a year or two ago, but there's still, you can still hear shelling going on once you're out there and you can hear gunfire on a regular basis. These, these were like small houses, just rows and rows of houses demolished um, in this district. And most of the people have fled a lot, uh, most of them into exile in, in Russia. Tens of thousands of refugees. This is a cemetery that was bombed. This is as close as I could get to the airport, but that's one of the major battlefields of the Ukrainian U.S.-backed Ukrainian war on the Donbass region. And these are some of the uh, comrades that I was staying with, um, uh, Svetlana and Denise, um, are from, uh, were active with Borotba uh, in Ukraine, were driven into exile, um, are now in Svetlana's uh, native city of Donetsk and they're doing amazing like grassroots communist organizing there. Um, Katya is a journal, young journalist and a student who works with them. And this is one of the Marxist gatherings that they organize on a weekly basis in an outdoor auditorium in the city, an outdoor amphitheater I should say. And there were probably like about 20 people on the Wednesday night that I was there, mostly young people. <clears throat> this is a film. They, ha they also have a weekly anti-fascist film showing at a local library. Um, after Donetsk, we traveled to Lugansk, the capital of Lugansk People's Republic, and this was uh, when we met with the, the Communist Party of Lugansk, who hosted me um, for most of my time there. Oh, yeah, the, people love fist t-shirts over there. Um, since, I, since my previous trip to Crimea a couple of years ago, um, it's become kind of a, like a stati communist status symbol <laughs> over there, so I, I took more of them. Um, this comrade uh, I spent a lot of time with. I met him in Donetsk. His name is Misha, and he's from um, Yakutsk in Siberia. Um, and he and a number of his comrades came all the way to Donetsk and Lugansk to volunteer as militia fighters in the anti-fascist militia. He uh, is a member of the Ghost Brigade, the Prizrak Brigade in Lugansk, but he was, um, because the fighting has subsided in some areas, they, a lot of people have been temporarily 
uh, decommissioned in, in order to not to take so much resources from the military. So he's like hanging out in Donetsk now, and he says, you know, I'm ready to, you know, at a moment's notice to go back um, to fight. And so this is, uh, actually this is very timely because just yesterday was the two year anniversary of a big Ukrainian uh, bombing attack on the capital of Lugansk. And this is a, um, a memorial outside of the government building there that was taken over by the resistance two years ago. Um, uh, and even, again, the capital in Lugansk also has been fixed up a lot, but just a couple blocks away from the government center, you can still see um, the damage that was done. And this is a recent memorial that was built. Um, this is a tank that um, is, a, is a memorial about two kilometers outside of Lugansk. And uh, has, uh, it was um, when, the, when the Ukrainian forces, when the fascist groups were pr trying to invade the city of Lugansk, um, the volunteer militia fighters in this tank stayed behind to, to give resistance while uh, most of the forces went back into the city to organize a defense. And the four um, militia fighters died, were burned alive inside. And so this um, tank has been moved over to the side of the road as a memorial. And uh, when, like just in the time that we were there, um, we stopped by the road for maybe 10 minutes um, to take pictures and half a dozen cars, uh, local, you know, folks, families and stuff came, stopped by the side of the road and brought flowers and things and it's just like a constant stream of people offering their thanks for the anti-fascist resistance that kept the city from being overrun. So then we went to um, uh, Krasnodon, which is another city in Lugansk, for, uh, this was the hall where the anti-fascist conference was held, and it, you know, it was, it was a mixed bag of in terms of who was organizing it. It was there, it had there were a lot of logistical problems and political problems with it, but it was mainly notable for being just an amazing gathering of international solidarity forces. That was the real draw of it, was to actually be able to meet folks and and connect and network with them. These are some students, um, uh, junior high students, who went to the school across the street um, and who wanted to pose with the Soviet flag uh, that we brought <laughs> from Donetsk. Um, so inside the hall, w the, the hall where the conference was held is like a museum to the Great Patriotic War, the, the Soviet anti-fascist war in World War II. So this is just one sample. There were like, you know, dozens if not hundreds of displays there. And while we were there, um, inside and outside, the, also the youth were, uh, it was a Saturday and Sunday, the youth were getting ready to perform for Victory Day. Um, Misha again, who I talked about earlier, and another uh, Ghost Brigade fighter, Rav, who comes from India, um, and just to sh give a sense of the international character of the militia and the anti-fascist forces there. Two really outstanding comrades who I was really fortunate to spend time with. Um, this is um, Maxim Chalenko, who is the head of the Communist Party in Lugansk, and uh, Dobri, who is uh, the communist, um, sort of the uh, political commissar of the Ghost Brigade, and a, uh, a communist from Russia who is playing a leading role in the militia movement. Comrade, you know, young comrades from Germany, from Canada, from Russia who were at the conference. Um, this is Alexei Albu who some of you may remember, we've printed a lot of interviews and things with him o over the last couple of years. He's a survivor of the Odessa massacre um, and also a leader of the struggle now in Donbass where he lives in exile. 
Um, this uh, uh, militia fighter, also from the Ghost Brigade, um, he's from Italy and goes by the uh, call sign Nemo. But um, he, when he heard that I was representing the International Action Center, he was very excited because he actually um, had met Sarah Flounders back in 1999 <laughs> in Yugoslavia, where he also fought on the side, of, you know, against the NATO um, aggression in Yugoslavia. And there's some more comrades. Um, this is Vlad, who was also from Odessa, who you may remember he was a political prisoner uh, in Ukraine for about six months. Um, and at the time of my last visit, and now he he was uh, exchanged in a prisoner exchange, and now is a member of the Ghost Brigade. Um, Alexei and me, and uh, and this was a comrade from Turkey who came to the conference. And then you know another some more of the comrades posing from, hmm. Oh, Zach Novak, yes, who some comrades here may remember who was active here in New York with the International Action Center. He now is, works, he does media work in Donetsk and is kind of like a so, semi-celebrity there. Um, then we went to um, the town of Kirovsk where the Ghost Brigade now has their uh, headquarters. And... Um, we got a tour of the front line. This was a, um, a what they call a block post, which is like right. Um, there's two hills, a valley in between. On one side is um, the anti-fascist militia. On the other side is the block post of the Ukrainian forces. So it's it's really right on the front line. And um, and there's Dobry again giving us a tour. Um, uh, when we visited, the, the soldiers and the locals uh, who were helping them were digging trenches be, uh, because um, a few, uh, a week or so before our visit, the Ukrainian forces had tried to advance by attacking a bus, uh, a bus stop in the area. Uh, and the only way, you know, they have much superior weaponry and vehicles, and so the only way to sort of prevent their advance is to dig trenches. And this was the block post with the Ghost Brigade flag flying. Um, one of the uh, Ukrainian missiles that had fragments from it. So here, this was sort of, here you can see the Ukrainian outpost with the flag of Ukraine and the flag of the right sector, the fascist flag of Stefan Bandera flying. It's a burned out tank. Um, so again, the, you know, the fighters living there, they're living a hard scrabble life. It's a very international group. There were, uh, when we visited there, you know, probably people from about a dozen countries, men and women, mostly young people. Um, Ludmilla, she's a comrade from Poland who wanted to try out the gear. And this is the kind of conditions that the soldiers are living in at, at the block post. Um, while we were there, um, it started out very sunny and, and sort of like beautiful weather. And all of a sudden, a storm came in, poured rain, then it started hailing like all within the space of a few minutes. And I, I asked them, you know, is this, does this happen a lot? They said, yeah, like a few days before, the, the sleeping area had been completely flooded and they were sleeping five people on an upper bunk. So this is not any kind of radical tourism that the internationalists are participating in. This is like hard uh, living. Um, so they, the soldiers spend two weeks there, then they're rotated out for four weeks to the, you know, to further out behind. Um, that's Pyotr Biryukov, um, also a leader of the communist forces in the Ghost Brigade and a deputy commander. 
Um, now, I know I'm taking too long with this. I just quickly want to go through. Th these are photos from Victory Day in Lugansk, which was really amazing. I've been to a lot of big demos. Um, never anything with the sense, with the feeling of solidarity that I felt there, though, between all the people, tens of thousands of people just streaming out. And you could really tell that um, this was not just a historic event. You know, people were carrying photos of their ancestors who had fought in the Great Patriotic War. Um, but this was also a city that had been threatened with fascist invasion just two years ago. And you could really feel that in the, in the solidarity and the outpouring of people of all ages. Uh, this is Lisa Chalenko, who I wrote about in one of the articles that was in Workers' World, who was, is two years old and who was just an infant at the time of the, when the war started. Um, this was with the Communist Party delegation, um, veterans of the Afghanistan war. Um, again, people really wanted to be photographed with the, the photos of their ancestors. Um, and in Lugansk especially, it was interesting that uh, it was the communist movement is really multi-generational. Um, this was our translator, and this was her daughter, who's like the press secretary of the Communist Party in Lugansk, and there were a lot of multi-generational um, uh, activists. Um, this is a comrade from who came to the conference from Britain who helped us carry our banner in the Victory Day Parade. Um, Lenin and Lugansk. Um, this is, in, I thought this was a great shot because people were like lining up to watch the march from this bombed out building in the center of the city. Um, and then again, to show the multi-generational character, this was uh, like a gathering at the Communist Party office after the parade. Um, there was uh, festivities, cultural events afterward, children's, uh, you know, things. And that was from our last night in Lugansk. We came across this huge Ukrainian missile that was just left <laughs> by the side of the building where it fell. So this is um, a view of uh, Chisinau, which is the capital of Moldova, which is a small former Soviet republic um, uh, to the southwest of uh, Ukraine. Um, we've written in the paper and done some actions in the IEC in solidarity with these political prisoners, um, the Petrenko group um, from the Red Bloc Party, who are in, in in their organizations in a big struggle with the right-wing oligarchy uh, government there uh, supported by the West. So this was at uh, one of their court hearings that I was able to attend um, and some strategically placed graffiti on their behalf right outside the courthouse, which was nice to see. Um, this is uh, their lawyer who's like a really, you know, is like, you know, Ramsey Clark of Moldova, basically. <laughs> and Petrenko, Gregory Petrenko, who's the leader of the Communist Party, uh, of the, well, not the, not the official Communist Party, which is rotten, but <laughs> of the Red Bloc Communist Party. Um, a lot of, like, um, tent cities of protests around the, around the capital of Moldova. This one was for homeless, this one was set up by homeless families outside the government buildings. Um, a museum we visited with some of the comrades which has this huge diorama, huge room, like circular room with a diorama of the liberation of uh, Moldova from the fascists during World War II. And this was, um, we visited the, this is the mansion where the chief oligarch in Moldova has his official residence uh, as well as residence of several of his lackeys in the government. And the, the car that they used when they had a tent city there last summer is still there because the engine was destroyed and the tires were slashed. So we just took a picture of that. 
Um, and this is the prison where um, seven of the comrades were held. It's like a, from the 18th century, and it's the conditions are horrendous. Um, right now, they're all out on house arrest, but they're forbidden from going to protests or traveling outside the country. This was uh, is the main anti-fascist war uh, memorial in Kishnau, which is just, I mean, it's huge and it's beautiful. It's five, it's the, the pillars are five Soviet rifles representing the five years of the Great Patriotic War. And a Lenin, um, the, the, the Lenin statue that used to stand in central Kishnau has now been moved, we say temporarily, to a park uh, in the city. So that's my like really short, I could, you know, do this for hours, but because I took a lot of pictures, but um, hopefully that gives you a little flavor of the places I visited. Um, so um, I could have easily given a whole presentation about the war situation in Donetsk and Lugansk, but what I especially want to bring to the party's attention tonight are important developments on the revolutionary left in that part of the world. Um, recently, Workers' World published an article from uh, one of our correspondents in Europe about the latest uh, US-NATO escalation over there, which is the stationing of so-called missile defense weapons in Romania and Poland and an associated radar system in Turkey. These are actually first strike weapons aimed at Russia uh, much like the Star Wars program proposed under the Reagan administration in the 1980s during the Cold War against the USSR. The comparison is important because um, I believe this is actually sort of under the radar is one of the biggest military escalations by NATO in the region since the Reagan era. It's certainly viewed that way in Russia and Donbass, especially coming on the heels of the last two years of um, NATO troop expansion and ever bigger and more provocative war games. Uh, one thing I heard repeated m many times by people during my visit was that um, World War III has already begun and the first front in the, the first front in the war is the US backed Ukrainian war on Donbass. Without trying to take away for a moment from the critical struggles unfolding right now in the Middle East, Latin America, Asia and the Pacific and Africa, um, I think it's important that we consider uh, whether we're really fully aware and prepared for the severity of the war danger that's unfolding on the periphery of the former Soviet Union. I think certainly the anti-war and radical movement as a whole in this country is not prepared for that. That's the bad news. The good news, which I hope the slideshow gave a little bit of a flavor of, is that there is a young, dynamic, revolutionary left emerging in the former Soviet Union. And investigating that was kind of an ulterior motive of my trip and uh, why I tried to go to so many places uh, and meet with people. And, uh, and it confirmed my impression that th this is a real living development. Um, it's rooted in youth and young adults under the age of 35. In other words, people who came into political life or were even born after the destruction of the Soviet Union and the restoration of capitalism roughly 25 years ago. Of course, there are also the best communist elements of the older generations who lived through the era of socialist construction are you know, part of it. Especially, this is evident in the Donbass, um, which was a center of miners and metal workers where socialist and anti-fascist traditions stayed strong even after the fall of the USSR. And it's no coincidence that that's where the resistance to um, the right-wing coup in Ukraine was the strongest. Um, people may have seen recently on social media, it's been going around a new survey um, that was taken recently uh, which just uh, confirms what several others in recent years have said, which is that a majority of residents of Russia and the other former Soviet republics wish they could restore the Union and the socialist system. But as a comrade in Lugansk explained it to me, 
um, she said, a, a genuine revolutionary movement today has to be based on those who've come up under the experience of capitalist exploitation, not based on nostalgia for the past. And that's what makes this development so exciting, is that that's exactly what's happening. Our party's in a unique position compared to most of the Western left to bear witness and develop strong political and working relationships with this new movement through our work in solidarity with the Donbass struggle and the anti-fascist resistance inside Ukraine. A lot of it, frankly, is because of our, uh, uh, our uh, forging of strong comradely bonds with the Ukrainian Marxist organization Baratba starting in the winter of 2014, shortly after the US-backed coup in Kyiv. And because of the party's consistent work and, uh, on the struggle in Ukraine and Donbass, and because of Barotba's unique history as an organization uniting revolutionaries from many different tendencies, um, this has helped to uh, open a door for us to meet and get to know many of these forces that we otherwise probably wouldn't even be aware of, including but not limited to the United Communist Party in Russia, um, the New Communist Movement, the Communist Union of Donbass, the Workers' Party of Donbass, um, the Lugansk Communists, and the Communist forces inside the Ghost Brigade, and the Red Bloc in Moldova, which were among the groups that I visited on my trip. All these forces have their own unique histories. Some emerged completely from post-Soviet grassroots sort of communist youth movements. Others, like in Lugansk, have long historical ties going back to Soviet times. But all of them are struggling um, and, and finding ways to network and, and build ties with each other to navigate the unique historical situation they find themselves in of trying to build a new communist movement on the ruins that capitalism has made of Soviet achievements. Um, what should be preserved of that period and what needs to be new and different? Um, the emergence of this new communist movement isn't limited to the areas that I visited. We're starting to learn about similar developments in places like Kazakhstan, Georgia, Latvia, and Eastern European countries like Poland and Bulgaria as well. I want to bring special attention uh, also to the importance of the internationalist fighters who have come to support the Donbass resistance, many of whom have gravitated to Prizrak, the ghost brigade founded by the late Alexei Moskovoy. Um, as we saw in the slideshow, the ghosts uh, include communist militants from many countries. They and their leadership um, share a perspective that this military experience that they're getting is, is crucial for the struggles that lie ahead, not only in Donbass and Ukraine, but in the global struggle to abolish capitalism. And you can read some of that in last week's Workers' World. There's an article um, uh, about uh, that in, in the issue that has the Venezuela headline. <clears throat> Regardless of who's elected to head the imperialist regime in Washington this November, no matter what accommodations the capitalist rulers of Russia may try to make to appease the West, the U.S. is determined to carve up Russia and make it into the ne neoliberal colony that they've been working toward for the last quarter century. As we rise to meet the challenge of stopping new wars, it's a very hopeful development that we have, are able to find new allies and comrades who we can depend on to join us in that struggle. Thank you. <laughs>